We're just gonna wait a few moments to give everyone time to join us. All right, we're gonna get started. Hello everyone and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Lead Poisoning of Raptors, Causes, Concerns, and Mitigation Strategies with Vince Slaby. Hello, how's everybody doing? And Ross Crandall. Hello. My name is Jamie Dawson. I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. And also joining me this evening is Bracken Brown, Hawk Mountain's biologist and naturalist. Hey everyone. As well as Tiana Johnson, Hawk Mountain's Autumn 2020 Education Trainee. Hi there everybody. We are so glad that you're all joining us this evening. As you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. And we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, thank you. Thank you so much for everything you do. And if you're joining us this evening and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges, and we are thrilled to offer our local and global community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, this program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on our YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform, and we've designated time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And now, a few words from my colleague, Bracken Brown. Hello, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this excellent program that we're gonna present tonight. Uh, I'd like to give a special shout out to our deer hunting community that helps Hawk Mountain Sanctuary maintain the wonderful woodlands that carpet most of our main sanctuary property. Um, so thank you to all of our deer hunters that help us with our deer population management plan, without which those browse lines would be going up. Uh, and a lot of our native shrubberies would be decimated on the sanctuary property. Uh, this is a very pertinent talk as this year Hawk Mountain Sanctuary is lead free for the entirety of the hunting season um, and we will be employing this moving forward in perpetuity. Hawk Mountain likes to partner with our hunters uh, because they are fantastic conservationists. Uh, if you look at not only the management uh, application for deer population uh, but on the federal level through things like the Duck Stamp or the Pittman-Robertson Act uh, since the 1930s, hunters have raised over $20 billion uh, that goes directly towards funding conservation efforts throughout North America. Close to three quarters of the budget for state uh, fish and wildlife comes through the hunter uh, applications. So, it's a vital part for conservation efforts throughout North America. So we always like to highlight everything the hunting community is doing for us, both locally, as well as across the entire nation here. So thank you all for joining and I hope you have a successful season and look forward to talking with you. Thank you so much, Bracken. And we are so excited that Vince Slaby and Ross Crandall are joining us this evening to teach us about a vitally important topic in raptor conservation, and that is lead poisoning. Before we go further, Tiana Johnson will take a moment to share some of Vince's and Ross's background experience with our audience. Hi, everyone. 
Vince is originally from central Illinois and graduated with a bachelor's and master's from the University of Illinois. Shortly after, he traveled west and quickly developed a strong interest in birds, bird research. Vince worked on multiple avian research and monitoring projects in California, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Wyoming before completing his PhD at West Virginia University in forest resources science. Vince's dissertation focused on lead poisoning of bald and golden eagles on a nationwide scale. At CSG, Vince's current research focuses on lead abatement strategies for bald eagles in the Atlantic Flyway and on identifying pre-breeding hotspots for golden eagles in Denali National Park. Additionally, Vince serves as an associate editor for the Journal of Raptor Research. Vince is a member of the Raptor Research Foundation, the Eastern Golden Eagle Working Group, and volunteers for Raptor View Research Institute and Craighead Beringia South. Vince, his wife Mosey, and two kids, Francis and Sonny, live in Bozeman, Montana. When not working, Vince enjoys spending time with his family, floating the river, birding, cross-country skiing, biking, and listening to Chicago Cubs baseball. For Ross Crandall, Ross currently serves as the executive director of Craighead Beringia South, a Wyoming-based nonprofit wildlife research organization. He's been involved in a variety of research projects from South America to Alaska, with focal species ranging from songbirds to raptors. Ross's research at Craighead Beringia South is primarily focused on nesting and movement ecology of raptors. When not working, Ross enjoys spending time outdoors with his wife, daughter, and his dog. Wonderful, thank you, Tiana. So Ross, how did you become involved in studying and working with raptors? So I'd like to say it's kind of an accident. Uh, in my early years as a field biologist, I, I've always worked in ornithology. Um, I've done some other things, but ornithology has always, has always grabbed me. The early years started more with songbirds and shorebirds, but my first raptor job was working with uh, barn owls in California, and it was real hands-on. We were doing a lot of banding, a lot of blood sampling, and uh, I was kind of hooked from that point forward, ended up working with Mexican spotted owls in New Mexico, and then ultimately ending up here in Wyoming, where, you know, my research is directly focused on raptors, so. That's kind of the, the story of how I got here. Wonderful, thank you for sharing that. Now Vince, a question for you. What inspired you to focus your dissertation on lead poisoning of eagles? Well, I, I started working about 12 years ago or 13 years ago for a couple of organizations uh, in Wyoming and Montana, both Raptor View Research Institute and Craig Ed Bringia South. And they both had focal projects by which they were collecting year-round data on raptor species and also seasonal data on raptor species where they were looking at both the causes of lead poisoning and the presence of lead in these birds. And it, it always just was something I really liked and I continued to do it for about 10 years and I saw an advertisement for a position uh, by which I could get an advanced degree studying the exact same thing and I went for it and was lucky enough to get it. And here I am today. Awesome, awesome. So uh, Ross and Vince, could each of you briefly share your personal connection to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary? Sure, I'll go first. I unfortunately have never had the opportunity to watch hawks fly by on the ridge at the sanctuary. Uh, fortunately though, I have been able to visit the site uh, my good friend Bracken Brown is sitting right here with us. And Bracken and I have worked on multiple projects together throughout the years. He was a uh, very, um, he was my lead field uh, biologist on my dissertation research. And I visited Hawk Mountain with Bracken during the off season when migration was not happening. And I see how beautiful of a place it is. And I also see the international influence that Hawk Mountain has and um, happy to be a part of the talk this evening with you guys. Thank you so much, Vince. Ross? 
Yeah, my connection with Hawk Mountain is primarily through the plethora of information that you guys have contributed to, to ornithology. I too have never been there. Well, I've never been there, period, let alone see the flight. But, you know, just everything that you guys have contributed is really, really my connection to Hawk Mountain. Thank you so much. And we are all excited and eagerly waiting in anticipation to learn more about the important work you both are doing. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Vincent Ross, for your presentation. Great. I'm going to start screen sharing. Let me know when you guys can see it. Looks good. Because Excellent. Well, thanks again for having us, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Again, my name is Vince Slaby, and I'm going to start this talk tonight talking about lead poisoning and raptors. Um, the first half of the talk will be primarily I'll be talking about the research I did as a graduate student at West Virginia University. Uh, the, the, the second part of the talk, Ross is gonna cover a program that both of us have just started in Wyoming. And this program is aimed at reducing golden eagle mortality from uh, lead poisoning in uh, central, excuse me, Southeast Wyoming. So just an overview of the talk this evening. First, I'm gonna kinda of just talk about lead in society and why it exists and why we use it. I'm gonna talk about lead poisoning specifically and how it affects humans and wildlife. I'm gonna talk about some specific sources of lead that affect all of us and wildlife. And then we're gonna focus in on raptors or avian predators and scavengers. To do this, I'm gonna talk about some of the completed research projects that we have done uh, looking at lead in raptors. And then again, Ross will cover uh, some mitigation strategies that are available both to all of us individually and to us as scientists. So lead has existed in our society for a very long time. Uh, one of the original sources of lead poison, one of the original sources of that lead was good for in society was the Romans used it for their plumbing systems. And they found that lead had a very low melting point, it was malleable, and it was extremely uh, corrosion resistant and just very easy to work with in the early historical times. Lead exists in many organic and in inorganic forms. Many compounds of lead are used um, throughout our society, including pesticides and fertilizers. A lot of agricultural chemicals include um, some amount of lead. There is industrial waste everywhere, uh, including uh, smelting facilities and also just um, landfills. Landfills can contain many waste products that contain lead. Lead still exists in vehicular emissions. It's not in our automobiles anymore, but it still is a common component of a lot of aviation fuel. Lead is existent in airborne ways through power plant, power plant emissions. Coal, coal burning power plants uh, emit lead as one of the particles that come out of that byproduct. Lead is still used in many paints. Lead is existent on roadways on industrial buildings and in other industrial settings. Uh, there's a reason why lead is in paint is it works very, very well and is very persistent. Lead is a byproduct of mining. There are many mining activities, uh, digging being one of the main activities that happens through mining. And through that activity, lead that is normally existed only in the Earth's crust is then brought to the surface of the Earth and made bioavailable to vertebrates such as us and wildlife. And lead also exists through recreational activities, such as hunting and fishing. One of those recreational activities is, is hunting, and it's through this, the use of ammunition. So hunters go out in the landscape. We, as hunters, harvest our animals. We gut our animals, and we take the edible portion home. But we always leave behind some edible portions for scavenging wildlife. And this picture I'm showing right now illustrates what can happen 
with a bullet or a projectile that is left out on the landscape in the gut pile. This is a, a radiograph of a bald eagle that consumed a bullet fragment, a very large, actually this is the entire projectile in this case. The, the bird ingested this incidentally while eating guts, while eating the, the rumen or the remnants of the animal on the landscape. And the picture on the right shows the recovery of that bullet after the necropsy. This uh, bald eagle died from lead poisoning. Now, just to influence, just to talk a little bit more about the fragmentation of projectiles that come out of uh, guns. This is a radiograph or x-ray of a gut pile that was left on the landscape. This is the, from a study that the Peregrine Fund did uh, several years ago. Now, what happens is as the bullet enters the animal, the stopping power of that bullet, part of what happens is, is that it fragments into multiple pieces as it passes through the animal and kills the animal. The bullet is meant to kill. And so what happens is, again, we leave this portion that you see on the screen on the landscape and any animal or scavenger that's in the area that wants to eat this then comes in and unknowingly may consume this. This uh, fragment is from a uh, very common rifle caliber of 270. So just a little bit about what happens when these fragments are consumed, when lead is consumed by humans and wildlife. First off, lead doesn't belong in our bodies. There is absolutely no biological role of lead in our bodies like there is for some other essential nutrients in metals. Lead is considered a neurotoxin, a carcinogen. It, one of the most particularly nasty things that lead can do to us is that it somehow the body thinks that lead is an essential nutrient. We ingest it or we inhale it and the body thinks that it's something good for us. And so the body then incorporates it as, as fastly and as, and as rapidly as it can. And it literally mistakes lead as an essential nutrient such as iron or calcium. Uh, some of the repercussions of lead poisoning include humans. We can have reduced cognitive function after a few or even one exposure event. Lead poisoning is tied to kidney disease. It's tied to cardiovascular disease in humans. In wildlife, it's very common for lead poisoning to cause decreased motor skills. And when we're talking about raptors, raptors are an, an animal that makes a living at tackling prey items, either out of the air or on the ground. And they need to be about themselves 100% to do those things. And when you talk about decreased motor skills, decreased energetics, and generalized lethargy from a toxicant like lead, then we, we, we see major issues. The other thing that lead does in wildlife is it hinders red blood cell production. This slide shows a bald eagle that was admitted in West Virginia at a place I volunteered for, many, for a few years during grad school. And this is the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia. This bald eagle was found on the side of the road. It was admitted. And the picture on the left shows, a, shows, it doesn't show a lot, but what it is showing is that this bird is panting or laboring to breathe with its mouth open the way that it has. It also is holding its wing down. This is an example of muscular atrophy or just overall lack of energetics, lack of muscular, um, it's just basically, affecting the bird to the point where it can't hold its wings up. It's, it's called wing droop. And on the right, you can't see this extremely well, but again, we're highlighting some lighter fragments found on the x-ray. This bird ended up dying just about a few hours after it was admitted from lead poisoning. So, raptors, avian predators and scavengers. The primary way that these, an these animals, these birds are being lead poisoned is through the ingestion of spent lead ammo. There, is, there are countless research projects on all continents that highlight this, that, that where the findings are pointing to this. Now, 
how does spent lead ammo get on the landscape? We talked about hunting, that's one method. We also have recreational shooting. Uh, out west here, we have uh, one, one hobby is to go out and um, shoot ground squirrels and prairie dogs. And the fragmented lead ends up in those dead animals and the raptors are, can come in and eat them and, and other scavengers. There's also predator control. Animals are shot for many different reasons, sometimes just because they're a nuisance. And those animals can be left on the landscape for consumption. Now the evidence that we find in the research that suggests spent lead ammo as a source to raptors, we see that there's a, there are, there is seasonality. So by that, I mean that some raptors eat live prey during some times of the year, and they scavenge other times of the year when that live prey is not available. Now we're seeing spikes in lead in those specific birds that only scavenge part of the year during that time of year when they are scavenging. Lead isotopes. You can analyze lead samples for their isotopic signatures. Specific isotopic signatures can point to specific sources of lead. There, it exists in the literature that, that some birds have isotopic signatures that is very similar, that some lead exposed birds have isotopic signature, signatures that are similar to ammunition. And more evidence is the use of non-lead ammo. So in this case, what we have is we have areas where birds showed up with high lead poisoning, and then shortly after, non-lead ammo was used by a specific portion of the hunting community, and more research then showed that lead, level, lead levels, lead concentrations went down in those birds that showed higher lead concentrations with the higher percentage of lead ammo use. So moving into some of my research, there is, we, and, and why our objectives were formed. There's limited research in Eastern North America prior to some of our projects. And we wanted to look at some of the birds that had been looked at in Western North America and Eastern North America. Additionally, we wanted to look at lead in a few birds, specifically golden and bald eagles at a nationwide scale. So through my dissertation, we, our overall goal, our overall objective was to understand sources and pathways of lead exposure of raptors by studying novel species, seasons, regions, and spatial scales. Again, this just meaning we're going to look at some new species, but we're also going to look at species that have already been looked at in a new area in Eastern North America. Um, also, again, we wanted to look at bald eagles and golden eagles uh, on a nationwide scale. So how do we get these samples from these birds? How do we obtain lead information for raptors? For live birds, we capture them, we ban them, we gain the sample through the blood, we take a blood sample and then we let them go. There are multiple trapping, uh, there are multiple forms of trapping. We have uh, up on the left, we caught osprey using a dome styled noose trap. Uh, on the top right, we used ball shot tree traps to catch butios, uh, red-shouldered hawks, red-tailed hawks. We used a mechanical owl there in the lower right and mist nets to catch uh, birds on their breeding territory, such as red-shouldered hawks. We used net launchers, the two pictures in the middle, uh, to catch eagles. Uh, basically, we put lay out carcasses, we lay out the net launcher near the carcass, the eagles come down to feed, and we fire the net launcher remotely over the eagles. Uh, the picture on the lower left is called a bow net, just another uh, way to catch raptors. Once the raptors are in hand, we're looking, once the live raptors are in hand on the right, we see a blood sample being taken in the brachial vein of the birds. And it's the same vein that we pull blood out of humans right here. And we also, for this study, were able to collect many birds that died. And federal agencies, veterinary clinics, all end up with dead eagles. And we were able to collaborate with multiple places in multiple states. And we were able to do tissue collection from these, from these birds. So we collected liver samples, kidney samples, uh, femur samples, feather samples. Uh, Bracken helped me a lot with that, who's, an, who's, who's with us tonight. He can tell you about that extensively. So moving forward into some specific research objectives that we had 
with my graduate work at West Virginia University. One was we wanted to look at the potential sources and lead concentrations of piscivorous raptors, specifically during the breeding season. So our question was, we think we know eagles and other animal, other raptors are getting lead during outside of the breeding season, but we're wondering if there is some source that hasn't been studied within the breeding season. It's important in toxicology research to look down every avenue. And so I wanted to see if there were sources and potential pathways of lead for osprey and bald eagles in the Chesapeake Bay the other thing we did besides test blood from these two species is we collected catfish and gizzard shad with the help of the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. And we tested the livers of those fish to see if they contain lead as a potential pathway from prey to raptor. Okay, what we found, and the letters above these box plots represent statistical differences between these two groups. On the left, we have bald eagles. On the right, we have osprey. The higher box plot on the left represents a higher lead concentration in bald eagles than we had in osprey in the Chesapeake region. The red line on this figure demonstrates the threshold for chronic lead poisoning or clinical lead poisoning. Now, as you can see, we did not have many birds above this threshold during the breeding season. We only had a few bald eagles that showed clinical lead poisoning signs during the breeding season. So we concluded that during the breeding season, bald eagles, yes, they have a little bit higher lead concentrations than osprey, but it is not to a point where it is extremely dangerous lead levels during the breeding season. And so we also concluded that the fish that they were eating, the, the gizzard chad and the catfish that are very common prey items for the, both of these species in the Chesapeake during this time of year, also did not have very high lead levels. So again, we concluded that bald eagles had higher lead concentrations than osprey. If they're eating the same thing during the breeding season, why is that so? We concluded that bald eagles, because they scavenge at other times of the year, it raised their ambient lead concentration levels in their blood higher than that would be of the osprey. Osprey are, are piscivores and they eat fish 98% of the time year round. They do not scavenge. Bald eagles like to eat fish and, uh, and, a, and a variety of other prey items during the breeding season. But after the breeding season, when those prey items aren't available, their, ten their tendency is to scavenge. Now, when a raptor consumes lead, that lead stays with them for a lifetime. So with each exposure event, this, the lead enters, the, the, lead enters the, the, the digestive system. From there, it is grinded down a bit and enters into the circulatory system. It moves through the soft tissue. As it moves through the soft tissue, it eventually is stored in bone. Now, once a, a species like a bald eagle starts storing lead in bone as it gets older, at some point during physiological stress, that lead is then potentially re-released out of the bone and back into the bloodstream. This idea is, is, is the reason why we think bald eagles had higher lead concentrations than osprey during the breeding season. Another research objective we had, again, during the breeding season, we wanted to see if red-shouldered hawks were obtaining lead, uh, had a pathway for lead exposure during the breeding season. And, and we also wanted to potentially look at different sources of that lead. We caught a sample size of birds, both from urban and non-urban settings. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of our main findings from this project, from the red-shouldered hawk breeding season project, was that Red-shouldered hawks in urban environments had higher lead concentrations than red-shouldered hawks in non-urban environments. But again, look at that red line for the threshold for clinical poisoning. There are not a lot of birds. We only had a few birds from both categories above that threshold. And so we concluded that birds from the urban environment had slightly higher lead 
concentrations due to the fact of urban environments have many, many sources of pollution that can include lead. If you test soils in urban environments, it reflects the use of leaded fuel for, for multiple, multiple years. And so even though we haven't used leaded fuel for 30 years, it still exists in the soil. And when it exists in the soil, it can be transferred to the to the to the speed to some prey items that exist in the soil. And red-shouldered hawks are famous for eating prey items associated with soil, such as earthworms and um, uh, other uh, earthworms and other species that are associated with soil directly. And so our conclusion was that the reason they had higher concentrations in the urban environment was this uh, tendency for urban environments to just have higher overall lead in, in the soil and in the prey species. So this land use effect, urban versus non-urban, and that pollution of, associated with urban created slightly higher lead concentrations, although not very dangerous lead concentrations in these birds, again, during the breeding season. So another research objective we had, we wanted to look at a, a suite of different species, a multiple species. We wanted to look at red-shouldered hawks, red-tailed hawks, American crows, turkey vultures, black vultures, bald eagles, golden eagles. And we wanted to look at now outside of the breeding season. We wanted to use this breeding season data that we had for multiple species, and we wanted to compare it to lead concentrations we were finding in these same birds outside of the breeding season. And so we looked at uh, facultative scavengers between seasons. A facultative scavenger, it's another way of talking about the bald eagle and some of these other beautios and some of these other birds that we're talking about that eat live prey during the breeding season and have a tendency to scavenge outside of the breeding season. The other thing we wanted to do, as I mentioned, we tested vultures. We wanted to compare vultures, which are obligate scavengers. Vultures uh, scavenge year round, regardless of the time of year. And regardless of what's around there, they're evolved to specifically scavenge all the time. And so we wanted to test the difference between these two types of scavengers. What we found, this is a very busy figure, but what we found was that bo both bald eagles and golden eagles had higher lead levels during the scavenging season, or SC, than during the post-hatching season, what I defined. And the post-hatching season is basically after they hatch eggs, it's the breeding season. So what we found is that these two facultative scavengers both had higher lead concentrations during a time of year when they were more likely to scavenge. When comparing the obligate scavengers to the facultative scavengers, we found that vultures had higher lead concentrations during the summer months when they were scavenging as compared to a group of facultative scavengers, American crows, bald eagles, red-shouldered hawks, and red-tailed hawks during the breeding season. So the fact that this foraging behavior, this feeding behavior, is what we concluded was a predictor of lead exposure. So just this, the common theme here is the scavenging is driving higher lead levels. Our last objective that I'm gonna cover that, of, of research that we've, that we've finished, we wanted to look at continental, continental scale patterns in eagles, both bald and golden eagles. We wanted to look at the differences between the species. We wanted to look at regional differences such as between the flyways. We wanted to look and see again, if there are seasonal differences. We looked at specific months of the year. We also wanted to see if older birds had higher or lower lead concentrations than younger birds. To do this, we used those samples we talked about collecting earlier. We, we looked at femur, liver, and blood samples to accomplish these goals. One of the things we found with golden eagles specifically in blood lead concentrations is that the birds in the Atlantic flyway had higher lead concentrations than the Central and Pacific flyways. Now this is important because the population of golden eagles in the Atlantic flyway tends to be much lower than birds in the Central and Pacific flyways. So potential causes of mortality become more important with lower population sizes. 
Um, this is a this is a figure showing the months of lead poisoning in bald eagle blood. Again, the red line going across is the threshold for clinical lead poisoning. If you see the months of November, December, and January, bald eagles had the highest lead concentrations during these months. This also happens to be the months where hunting seasons are most common in North America, particularly in the United States. Excuse me. This is a figure showing femur concentrations in bald and golden eagles. Again, pay attention to the red line that demonstrates the clinical lead poisoning threshold. For bald eagles, we had a sample of 194 femurs from across the country. 39% of these birds had clinical lead, had, had lead concentrations above clinical lead poisoning thresholds. We had a sample of 247 femurs for golden eagles. 34% of these birds had femur lead concentrations considered above the threshold for, for clinical lead poisoning. So conclusions from the Eagle Project. We found that overall bald eagles were more regularly exposed to lead than golden eagles. We found that golden eagles had higher lead concentrations in the Atlantic flyway than when compared to other flyways. We found that lead exposure was highest during months that were associated with hunting seasons. We found, as far as the age analysis, we found that bald and golden eagles both had higher lead concentrations as adults than they did as juveniles. And again, this makes sense because lead is accumulated through time in eagles and in, and in vertebrates in general, in humans, in anyone, lead never leaves your body. So with each exposure, your, your lead concentrations in your circulatory system, such as your soft tissue and your blood, could have the tendency to go up. So this is in line with the age differences that we saw. But one of the, the, the primary finding was that all eagles that all eagle groups that we looked at spatially, regionally, by age class, they all were frequent, frequently exposed to lead. With that, I'm going to conclude this portion of our talk. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge West Virginia University, Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, the, the USGS, and lots of people that assisted with data collection. And with that, I would like to pass this talk over to uh, my partner in crime on a new uh, project looking at uh, mitigation strategies for lead poisoning in golden eagles in Wyoming. Take it away, Ross. Thanks, Vince. So Vince covered kind of the issue and why it's a problem, why it's something that we need to care about. But we felt it was important to also cover the fact that there are options to mitigate or lessen the impact of lead poisoning. And so we're going to do that by highlighting a, a recent effort that Vince and I put together, a research effort. And it's called Testing the Efficacy of Non-Lead Ammunition to Offset Golden Eagle Mortalities at Wind Farms. So some of you probably know this, but just in case you don't, uh, there's this idea in this country, the Fish and Wildlife Service developed this plan called uh, TAKE, so basically legal TAKE. And what it does is it allows for wind energy development without impacting golden eagle, specifically golden eagle populations. And so the idea is somebody has a wind farm that they're proposing and wind farms, you know, have potential to impact golden eagles more than other things, where they're found on the landscape, where they put the turbines, all overlap directly with golden eagle habitat, or they can. And so the idea is you go in and estimate how many eagles you expect to kill in a given year, and then you have to make up for those numbers and by doing something else. So for example, you might have a proposed wind farm where they say they're going to kill eight eagles per year. They're required within the same general geographic area to do something to save or reduce the deaths of 12, so one and a half times the number that they're expected to kill. And right now, the primary method to offset those mortalities is retrofitting power lines. And 
you know, industry and other people say that you can only retrofit so many power lines in a given area. And so there are more options that are needed that they can use that are effective to offset these mortalities. Now, lead abatement or decreasing the amount of lead on the landscape has been discussed as an option for a long time, but it's never been formally tested. So Vince and I decided to just go out and try to test it, see whether a non-lead ammunition distribution program is effective at reducing eagle mortalities and also to quantify that reduction. So our first question is just how many people can we get to participate? We're going to have free ammo, but how many people can we reach and how many people will actually take this free ammo? And then how many people will use it, to actually harvest animals? You know, we can give people ammo all day long, but if they go out to the range and blow it, it's not doing the birds any good. So we need to know how many people are actually going out in the field and using it to harvest an animal. And then lastly, with those two things, what's the estimated reduction in eagle mortality as a result? And at the end of this program, I think Vince said we just started, this was our first hunting season, one of two. After the second season, we'll be able to assess whether it makes logistical sense. So can we provide kind of the framework that industry needs to, to have an effective non-lead ammunition distribution program? And then does it make financial sense? Everything has to make financial sense in order to be viable, and this is no exception. And you know, it, we're gonna be talking a little bit later about dollars per eagle saved. And I hate to minimize an eagle's life to that, but the reality is it has to make financial sense in order to be a viable method to offset mortality. Our, pro our program is focused specifically in Southeast Wyoming. And the, the funding for this project came from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation's Wyoming Golden Eagle Fund. And that fund was created from fines that Duke Energy had to pay as a result of killing a bunch of eagles at a wind farm. And so the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation takes that money and distributed it for eagle conservation within the state of Wyoming. Therefore, our project is Wyoming specific. And we chose this area in Southeast Wyoming to target our program. The reason we chose this area is for three things. One, it's amazing golden eagle habitat. This is a picture that Vince took last week when we were down in the study area. It's just classic Western US golden eagle habitat. It's got topography for updrafts that they can exploit for flying. It's got prey, prey dogs everywhere, cottontails and um, jackrabbits based on you know cycles. It's just a great place. There's nesting habitat, but there's also a huge influx of migrants or wintering birds, which will be coming now and, and into the next couple of weeks. In addition to that, incredibly, incredibly popular area for wind energy development right now. This is another picture that we took last week when we were in the study area. That little black dot in the middle is a bald eagle flying through one of the wind farms. From people that have spent time there in the last 10 years, they said 10 years ago there weren't any wind farms. Now there are a ton. And Vince and I can attest to the fact that there are Met Towers everywhere. And Met Towers go in before wind farms go in. So this is an extremely popular place right now to target wind energy development. And then lastly, hunting. The proxy that we use to estimate the threat of, of lead poisoning to raptors is basically hunter harvest. So the more animals that are taken by hunters, the higher risk of lead poisoning or lead toxicity in raptors. This area has a really high amount of hunting pressure for uh, antelope, deer, and elk. And so those three reasons we chose this area specifically in southeast Wyoming. And I'm going to kind of walk you through how we're doing everything. It's pretty simple, but I'm just going to walk through it. The first thing we had to do was identify eligible hunters. I grew up in Wisconsin and to get a hunting tag in Wisconsin, you know, you just go to ACE the week before opening day, get your license and you go out. I don't know about Pennsylvania, I think it's similar, but in Wyoming and a lot of the Western states, it's totally different. There are some places, there are some units within a state where you can get a general or an over-the-counter tag, but a lot of the units require a, a limited draw sort of thing. So people in uh, the winter and early spring will apply for an antelope deer or an elk tag in a given unit and then only a certain percentage of them get those tags. And so we targeted those people in our study area because we knew they would be hunting within the confines of our study area, which was really important for us to estimate the reduction in golden eagle deaths. 
once we got, once we identified our, 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 the hunting units within our study area and the information for these hunters in the state of Wyoming is actually public. So we were able to just make a formal request to the state and we got all the names and addresses of all the people that held permits within our study area. And from there, then we contacted them with a little uh, mailer, which I'll show you in a second, and we provided this voucher ID. And so every hunter that we contacted got a postcard that looked just like this. One side was a hunter, the other side, it just said, hey, congratulations on drawing a tag. Based on where you drew a tag, you're eligible for two free boxes of ammo. We gave two free boxes to everybody just so they had more than enough to sight in their rifles and to hunt with. And we gave them this voucher ID, which was an independent or a unique number rather for everybody that was in the program. It gave us a way to keep track of people and it helped us kind of keep weed people out that might be trying to take advantage that weren't actually eligible. And then we sent them to this website. And the website is sort of the, the foundation for how we actually got people the ammunition. And so this is the homepage for the website. And you know, people get a card, they see that website, it's huntersforeagleconservation.org, and it had all the information that they need specifically for the program or for the project. So why are we doing what we're doing in the state of Wyoming? What is the issue, like more broadly, why is lead an issue for raptors? Uh, we had a, a thing on funding source. A lot of people want to know where the money comes from for something like this. They don't want their tax dollars used for it. So we assure you, we assured them that that was not happening. And then most importantly, it was the portal for people to actually use their voucher ID and get free ammunition. And we had this little tab in the upper right that said get ammo. Once you hit the get ammo or you go on the get ammo page, we have a, a really simple little form where you put your name, your email, your voucher ID, and then you agree to the terms of participation. And the only term of participation for our project was to take a survey at the end of the season. And I'll get back to that in just a second. So after you enter the forum, you agree to the terms of participation, you're redirected to a list of all the ammunition choices that we were providing. You choose what you want, you click that, and you, take a, you were taken to Selway Armory's website and Selway was a partner with this. They're an ammunition distributor out of Missoula, Montana. Absolutely fantastic to work with. And you type in two, quantity two of whatever you wanted. They gave us a little code. You put in a code, the price went away, and the hunter was able to purchase their ammo or get their ammo rather sent right to their house to use for hunting season. And then they went hunting. And in our study right now, that's where we sit. This is sort of peak hunting season. People are out using their ammo, hopefully, you know, getting some animals with them. What we're going to be doing next is using a survey to assess use and success. And so we want to know how many people actually used it in the field and how many people were successful in harvesting an animal with it. Really simple set of questions, but it allows us to estimate its use out there so we can quantify the reduction in golden eagle deaths. And then finally, at the end, we can quantify the cost per eagle saved. And we do have a little bit of preliminary data on that just from this year, making a few assumptions, which I'll go into here in a minute. But as of 1013, when I put the slide together two days ago, we had contacted 42% of the hunters. And that's, this is kind of the end for season one. We contacted 42%. We had limited funds. We couldn't contact everyone. We couldn't give everyone free ammunition. And we were limited in what, how many cards Vince and I could actually physically send out. So we got, got a hold of about 1,300 folks. 434 of those people actually ordered ammo successfully, which is about 32% of the people we contacted and about 13% of all the tag holders for the unit, which comes into play when we start estimating the reduction in gold eagle deaths. So last week, Vince and I were doing density studies in the study area. And we estimated the, the population right now, or the, the abundance right now, pre-arrival of most wintering birds or migrants at around 350 birds, 350 golden eagles. And so using that, that 350 number and the number of hunters that got ammo, and again, this is not including the survey results, which is gonna help inform this much better and tell us whether our assumptions are right, whether you know most or all people used it or not. But assuming everybody used it, we can estimate approximately 60 golden eagles would die if nobody used it at all. And based on that 13%, we would say that 52 eagles would die. And again, this is within the study area, 52 eagles would die as a result of the program. 
And so we're saving a net of eight eagles. So our rough and preliminary estimate, again, this is not including our survey data, but just a rough and preliminary estimate of cost per eagle saved is $5,736, which might sound like a lot or it might sound like a little, but if we compare it to the primary method that's used now, which is retrofitting power lines, the cost per eagle saved there is $15,200 to $35,000 per eagle. So there's potential that this non-lead ammunition distribution step could be a really effective and important method to offsetting uh, take, or offsetting eagle deaths rather at wind farms. So what? So increased use of non-lead ammunition can and does reduce eagle deaths. You can model it, you can estimate it, you can do all this kind of math you want around it, but it's also intuitive, right? So we know that eagles are being poisoned on the landscape. It's just something that happens as a result of eating gut piles from animals that have been shot with lead. So if 100% of hunters are using lead ammunition, every single gut pile might, may or may not have lead, but an eagle on the landscape has a very high probability of interacting with a gut pile that has lead fragments in it. If 50% of the hunters are using non-lead, then the probability that an eagle interacts with a gut pile with lead is reduced greatly. So increasing the use of non-lead ammunition just does reduce the threat to eagles. Non-lead ammunition distribution programs like Vince and I have, at least our results show, it might be a really effective way to offset deaths caused by other sources that are harder to limit. And whether those sources are energy dependent, or, you know, energy related like wind energy, which is something that we need. You know, we need renewable energy in this country. We need energy, we all use it, we have to have it. It does have a cost, but maybe we can offset that cost effectively. There are other things that are a lot harder to deal with than increasing use of non-lead ammunition. For example, uh, uh, shooting, illegal shooting is a really high cause of death with golden eagles, especially in the West. It's a very, very hard thing to limit. But if we can increase the use of non-lead ammunition for hunting, a different source of mortality, we might be able to somewhat offset illegal shooting or other things. And there's a role for programs like ours. You know, this program is very formal and I think of it almost kind of like a top down, like we're doing the work, we're getting you the ammo, we're modeling it, we're doing all this other stuff. But the thing that is really cool to me about this whole issue, lead poisoning and raptors, is if you hunt or if you know somebody hunt, you can very, very easily take an active role in eagle conservation simply by walking into a store and buying and using non-lead ammunition. It's really easy, it's really straightforward. We talk about, you know, $5,700 per eagle save. The fact of the matter is you could go into a store, you could buy a box of ammo for 40 bucks or 50 bucks, and you might save an eagle simply by using that. So it, it's something that, you know, there's a lot of science behind it, but at the end of the day, it's something everybody that hunts, or if you know a hunter, buy them a box of non-lead ammo. It's something we can all very easily participate in. And with that, I wanna just leave it with kind of a, a, a story that I have from my hunting experiences. My wife and I are both hunters. A few years ago, in 2018, my wife got an elk tag really close to our house. She shot an elk, and I've always wanted to put a, gut, or a camera on the, on the gut pile, on the carcass, after we leave. I'm curious what comes, whether it's mammalian or avian, but in the context of, of lead, I'm even more interested. I wanna know, are eagles actually visiting these gut piles after we leave? And so this is the, this is the remains of our carcass. You know, we quartered the elk out and took the edible portions out and we left the rib cage and the gut pile. And so when I, by the time I got out there, a lot of it had been eaten, but there was still plenty there. And in the week that I had the camera up, I had literally hundreds of photos of eagles. Not hundreds of eagles probably, but hundreds of photos of eagles. And here you can see three goldens on the carcass. Uh, here's a beautiful shot of a hatcher golden flushing from the carcass. Uh, we had bald uh, ravens, everything, all the scavenging birds that we would expect for that time of year. And so for me, really, you know, again, we can think about this as in-depthly as we want, but it is as simple as if you hunt and you shoot something and you shoot it with non-lead, you walk away from that gut pile and you have no chance whatsoever of poisoning these magnificent animals. So with that, uh, I'm done.
Uh, thank you, Ross. That was amazing, uh, fascinating. And thank you, Vince, as well. Um, amazing presentation. And I think now uh, Bracken Brown is going to lead us uh, through some questions from the audience. Get my mute off. Absolutely. Uh, so we have a couple questions. Uh, this first one seems to be targeted more towards your section of the talk, Vince. Um, and they're asking, how long does it take post-ingestion for the lead to integrate into the bones and no longer be found in the blood? Is blood alone a good indicator of lead concentration? Or would you recommend also sampling a second tissue to look at past exposures? That is a great question. So one of the things I failed to mention with my study is the, the question you present is one of the main reasons why we decided to test multiple tissues. So in general, blood is tests is a is a is a measure of acute exposure. So as an ingestion event happens, we have lead in the blood from anywhere to from 20 to 30 days after the ingestion event. And so that is considered acute exposure. Uh, more of a mid exposure measure is soft tissue such as kidney and liver. Now the bone is a measure of chronic lead poisoning. This is the storage facility for lead and it is a, it, 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 it in no way measures a recent exposure event. You don't know when the events happened. You just know that by that accumulating, by that accumulating lead in the bones that multiple exposures have happened. Now there is a caveat with testing lead in blood. As I mentioned, at some point, and the birds can reach a physiological a point of physiological stress that can cause lead to be re-released out of the bones, which is very similar again to calcium. Lead can disguise itself as an essential nutrient that is stored in bones, such as calcium, and likewise can be re-released. So you have to be careful with measuring lead in blood because it can be measure of acute and chronic poisoning. And the best example of that, again, are the age differences we see in these birds. We almost always see higher lead concentrations in adults than we see in younger birds. And uh, that, that higher lead concentration in blood of older birds can again be that ambient level. It may not go below a certain level once they reach a certain age and, a, and, a, and the amount of exposure events that are associated with that age. So if you were embarking on a study, I think that it's great if you can do uh, multiple measures, you know, whether you can, you can do maybe blood and, uh, and tissue or blood and bone, but it's always good to be able to uh, compare two of, those, uh, two of those methods of measurement and be able to understand exactly what those specific tissue or blood or bone are representing. Great question. Excellent. Thank you, Vince. Um, next, there's a couple questions uh, that are two parts. So why is lead used in ammo in the first place? What are the primary substitutes for lead moving forward? And what is the associated cost difference? in ammunition for hunters. You want me to do that one, Vince? Yes, please, yeah. Ross, thank you. All right, so, so lead is primarily used because it's easy to work with. Like Vince said, it's very malleable. So it's easy to mold into bullets. It's been, I mean, it's the original material that bullets were made out of, you know, round balls and all that stuff was lead because it was available and it was easy to work with. It's cheap. Uh, it's cheaper than, than other alternatives. So primarily that. Um, the second part I think was alternatives and the primary alternatives right now are copper, at least for high powered rifles, it's copper and gilding metal, which is 95% copper and a mix of 5% of other things that help make it a little bit less dense. The price difference, you hear a lot about price difference. You can go out and buy a box of the cheapest Remington uh, Corlock for say a 270 for probably like 18 bucks. And the cheapest copper option at this point for that 270 might be a tad under 30, but more commonly, you're gonna be spending somewhere between 35 and $50 per box. It's very similar to any other premium ammunition. If you just go out and get the cheapest thing you can, 
it's going to be more. But if you shoot premium ammo, which a lot of people do, it's ballpark the same price. Excellent, thank you. Um, next question is, uh, does lead from shot get into the meat and are hunters' families at risk of lead poisoning? Are hunters educated about this risk to their families? Is it a risk? Go ahead, Ross. I'm gonna share a picture why Ross talks. Yeah, so that's something that's talked about a lot is what is the risk of eating an animal that's been shot with lead? And in general, there's been a few studies that have shown hunters who eat meat, game meat shot with the lead, have higher blood lead levels. The, that increase, that higher blood lead level is relatively small. So it depends how you want to interpret those in, that information, those data. Do you want to say hunters have elevated lead levels or do you want to say, yeah, it's higher, but it's minuscule, so it really doesn't matter. In general, yes, like Vince is showing this photo right here, which is uh, game, packaged game meat, right? Yes. This is a this is a photo of, of packaged game meat. A friend of mine, when I lived in West Virginia, he was up in Pennsylvania and he hunted with his dad and he shot a deer and he gifted me with a couple of packages of game meat and which is awesome. I absolutely love it. And uh, to I, I had sort of talked to him about my project and I asked him if he minded if I took it in. I was working with a local vet facility and they were letting me bring in packaged meat to. Uh, x-ray them for metal fragments. So if you look at this picture, if you look at this x-ray, the the marker is this rectangular item, the metal marker is this rectangular item. So that marker is on the table to show you what metal looks like in the packaged meat. If you look at this bottom package, you see these little specks of white all through here. Now, did I dissect this package and 100% confirm that each of those little specks were lead. I know they're metal because of the marker. We know they're definitely metal, but you have to think about it. What other metal could that potentially be? I confirmed with my buddy that he used a lead uh, rifle projectile. This uh, lead was in the meat. I politely told him, I thank you, but no thank you. I will not be consuming that. I personally have a couple of small children in my house. And the, the risk, whatever it may be, I can speak to the risk of birds. That's my specialty. I'm not going to go long-winded and speak to the risk of humans. But if it's above 0%, you will not find me eating, eating lead that was har eating game meat. And I love game meat. Eating game meat that was harvested with lead ammunition. And more specifically, you will not find me feeding it to my children. Children are much more susceptible to toxicants like lead. Yeah, yeah, and I would just add like, you know, it, it comes back to that whole idea, like wh why do it if you don't have to, you know? And there's, Vince and I have heard it, people say it all the time, well, I, I grew up eating game meat and I'm fine. Yeah, okay, cool. But given the choice, why would you, like, why would you eat lead? It just doesn't make sense. So, I mean, it, it just, it you know, it doesn't pass the sniff test. If you don't have to eat lead, you won't eat lead, period, right? So that's the way I see it, at least. Good answer. And uh, especially considering children are growing and developing anything that's going to impact neurological uh, processes, uh, that's a much higher risk age than, say, an adult uh, who has an established ner nervous system. So definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, next question uh, is, you mentioned the fact that a box of non-lead ammunition is about $40 to $50. I'm currently paying about $20 for a box of 20 rounds of 30-06 ammunition. And I wonder whether there is any program back east here in Pennsylvania subsidizing non-lead ammunition purchases. Also, is there any health risk associated with non-lead antimony ammunition purchases? So I, I can take the first part of that. Yeah, if you if you are buying like Remington Core Lock, it's going to be around 20 bucks. 
there's a federal line of, I, I, I can't, I think it's PowerShock, that is a, a less expensive copper alternative. So I think, I think you said 30 yacht, you can get a box of 30 yacht copper for I think around 30 bucks. So it's maybe $10 more. Um, I don't know of any programs personally out east, and Vince, you can chime in as well. I, I'm not sure of any programs out east. One thing that we didn't talk about with lead and non-lead is weight retention, and that is how much of that bullet sheds from the time it enters an animal to the time it leaves the animal. And if a say a, a Remington Corlock enters a enters a animal, it's weighing 100 grains, and it exits at 50 grains, then it's lost 50 grains. That weight loss is 50 grains. 50 grains of lead is within that animal. Copper and the monolithics have, which is what we call all the non-lead rifle ammunition or bullets rather, monolithics, have near 100% weight retention. It's very odd to find anything under 95%. So it's not leaving anything in, it's not leaving anything in behind. It's the what goes in is basically what comes out. So there really are no health risks, health risks, excuse me, associated with the alternative to lead. And, and Vince, I don't know if you want to chime in on the East, any programs in the East. Sure. There are no programs currently in the East that I am aware of, but this idea of mitigation and for subsidizing hunters, again, hunters are some of the best conservationists out there. And People like Ross and I are always thinking of ideas, uh, wherever it may be, here in the West, back East, to subsidize copper ammo to make it more affordable for hunters. And so no programs I'm aware of now, but keep your eyes and ears open. Uh, it could happen soon. The last thing I'll say about copper versus lead, with that retention, um, it's copper has a toxicity threshold. So it's not like copper is good for you and lead's bad for you. Copper is bad for you, but it's not a neurotoxin. It's not a metabolic poison. Plus, as Ross said, when you have near 100% retention of that copper projectile as it passes through the animal, the chances of consuming some of that copper are very low. So I just thought I'd add that to, to that question and answer. Excellent. Thank you. Well put. Um, and the need to move forward and improve things. Uh, Hopefully we'll have programs in place on the East Coast, uh, but definitely when you're shopping for ammunition, it can be challenging to find a non-lead alternative shop. Uh, but the internet is a phenomenal place and a couple of distributors are now adding a toggle feature so you can refine your search for non-lead only ammunition and that's making it easier uh, when you're looking to purchase uh, your rounds for the upcoming season. Uh, next question, has lead type testing been done to see if lead in fishing tackle uh, has been a significant cause of poisoning? Uh, Vince, this is probably going to you with all your, that osprey work and pulling tackle out of nests. <laughs> yeah, Bracken, you helped with that. You had to climb into a lot of those osprey nests. So one of the sub questions we had with the osprey was they put so many crazy things in their nests including fishing tackle. And, and, and fishing tackle will end up in near the osprey. Uh, we were wondering if osprey were potentially consuming fishing tackle or bald eagles were consuming fishing tackle. Uh, you know, say you snap a jig off or a, a lead uh, lure off into a fish and is that then passing to the birds? What we found specifically in the Chesapeake is we didn't think that was happening very often. What I will direct you to is some research that's being done in the Northeast, in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont. Uh, common loons are, their foraging behavior, they'll, from the surface of the water, they'll dive down and they'll, and they'll ingest rocks and, and sediment similar to rocks to help them break down some of the food that they're eating. Now, in areas with high fishing pressure, these loons are actually consuming lead sinkers, lead jigs, and it is leading to a serious problem. There are actually document a paper came out recently this year, and they are seeing population level effects from lead poisoning in common loons, and, and directly as a result from of fishing tackle. And so right now there is some effect on raptors, such as pisciferous raptors, raptors that eat fish, but 
the main concern right now is with, with some water birds like loons that are ingesting that type of uh, a lead found in the environment. Yeah, and just in addition uh, to that, you know, uh, it was almost 30 years ago that uh, waterfowl hunters switched away from using lead pellets because of uh, active cases of lead poisoning where geese, swans, ducks were foraging and consuming the pellets that were in the sediment at the bottom of water um, as grit to help them grind up their food and then dying from lead poisoning. So that's been a phenomenal success story in that you remove the lead exposure and you've seen a rapid decline in uh, chronic clinical level uh, poisoning events. So that's a excellent reason that loons are dealing with fishing tackle, unfortunately not a broader scope of pulling up lead pellets. Um, final question that we currently have is, do any states have non-lead regulations? Uh, the, no, not at a statewide scale. There's regulations based on some refuges and some state lands. Um, most of that is targeting shotgun. You know, there was some movement at the end of the Obama administration to ban lead from wildlife refuges, period. And that didn't happen. That didn't go through. But at the state level, there's currently nothing. California is, they have a lead ban. I don't actually know that much about it, if it's part of the state or the whole state. Um, but that's the only state moving in that direction that I'm aware of. Yeah, so California did initiate a statewide lead ban. Uh, previous to this lead ban, the, the lead ban was only for uh, the current range of the California condor. So the California condor is another animal similar to loons in that there are population level effects from lead poisoning on that species. And that's an endangered species. And so California enacted several years ago this law uh, outlawing the use of lead ammunition within the range. They, re they recently just pushed through legislation to outlaw the use of lead on a statewide basis. Um, I just want to add something really quickly about that. I don't want to get political or, or get too deeply into this, but it, I think that states and, and jurisdictions need to think deeply about that type of um, legislation. I don't personally think it's a very good idea. I think that what we're doing right now in this, in this talk, in this Zoom call, and just talking about it and educating people, people like Ross, and I and, and, and Bracken, who knows a lot about this topic, just going out and talking about it, I think people will switch on their own. And a lot of people, you know, may not be real keen on a government regulation, you know, a form of legislation that tells you what kind of ammo to use. I think that, again, as conservationists and as we learn more about all of this, I think that a lot of people can make that decision on their own through exactly what we're doing right now. And, you know, legislation, you know, it, it's not even gonna be an option in most states. It would never reach that point. And California is not one of those states that did reach that point. But I think we have a lot of work to do before we even consider going to that level. I will, I will say too that in where I live in Grand Teton National Park, there's, they can't call it an elk hunt, it's an elk reduction program. Uh, it's an elk hunt, and they have mandated the use of non-lead ammunition. And um, that, that's one area where I actually studied the decrease in lead as a result of the increased use in non-lead. And beyond small places like that, yeah, it's, it's left to the hunters making the decision to use it. Thank you, gentlemen. And Bracken, that wrapped up the questions, correct? Yep, that wraps up the questions and uh, we look forward to getting updates as you guys begin to collect your data set because it's only through data-driven decision-making uh, that we can uh, help people uh, make these sorts of assessments. Uh, and it honestly is a risk assessment if you're gonna use lead or non-lead when you're hunting for personal consumption. So we'll keep you tuned and hope to uh, share your results uh, moving forward in the next couple of years. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you Thanks so much. Thanks for having us.
thank you. It's uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing everything, Vincent Ross. Um, I love that you offer solutions. You know, we all know humans we're the biggest threat to raptors, but that means we're also the solution. And um, you know, now now that we know what's happening with the lead poisoning, um, there's a moral obligation uh, to do better and to use an alternative. And as we discovered tonight, it's better for humans as well. So. So thank you so much. Thank you to our wonderful audience for joining us this evening. It, we really, truly appreciate it. Um, we hope to see you at Hawk Mountain. Come visit us. Check out our website. Um, we have a lot of uh, trail fees can be purchased in advance uh, for, for COVID, to help with COVID. And we also ask for exact change. We have lots of programs coming your way. A little sneak peek for this weekend. On this Saturday, we have an introduction to hammock camping workshop from 3 to 5 p.m. Also this Saturday at 5 o'clock p.m., we have our autumn lecture series. It is with Dr. J.F. Terrien, Climate Change and Its Impact on Raptors. We're going to be doing that on site in our amphitheater and also offering it as a live Zoom webinar at the same time. Um, the following Saturday, October 24th, we have another autumn lecture series on site in our amphitheater behavioral variation in hybridizing chickadees. And we also plan to offer that lecture as a Zoom webinar as well. And then Thursday, October 29th, another autumn lecture series. This one is purely virtual. Um, Team Warbler from Chesapeake Bay to Panama Bay. And I will conclude with Halloween. Um, we have an Halloween celebration at Hawk Mountain in our education building from 10 a.m. to noon, and there is a costume contest, so I want to see you all there. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. We hope to see you again soon. Bye for now. Hey, everyone. <laughs>